Life, how the bleep are you? Good. It's good to see you. I want to welcome those of you watching at Church Online at our downtown campus, our Amarillo campus, or maybe one of our network churches around West Texas. We are excited that you're here with us as well. Um, we are in the middle of a series called Bleep, and it's funny because if you were to ask one of our pastors, um, many of us have had people come up to us after a service and say, man, that message was just bleeping awesome. Um, or your band bleeping rocks. And, you know, obviously it kind of catch you off guard there for a second. And we're just thrilled that, you know, people who aren't normally in church, like want to come to experience life. We think that's awesome. It's part of our vision. It's what we want to see happen, uh, but it's still kind of catch you off guard. And so the only way, you know, you know, to respond kind of in a moment like that is, well, I mean, bleep and appreciate that. Um, you know, thanks. Thanks for the compliment. Um, but Christians can do the same thing uh, sometimes. Like if you've been at church or been in church for very long at all, you start to develop this new language and you, you can uh, start to develop and use different terms and terminology when you talk about different things that relate to church. And I'm sure, like I can only imagine that some of the things that we say, some of the terms that we use um, would have to weird out someone that doesn't go to church. Like, I think it could catch them off guard, some of the things that Christians say. You, you have to admit, some of the things Christians say sometimes and our terms for things can be a little bit strange. How many of you, all of our campuses, you've done the Christian cussing thing? Like, flipping or fricking or son of a bee sting? Anybody? That's no, I've never done that one. Uh, but, okay. Well, anyways, in this series, Bleep, we've been talking about how the tongue... Um, can be a tool that's used for good, but it also can be very destructive. And so last week, Brandon Gwynn, one of our worship pastors, talked about how uh, just the, the power of the tongue and that it can be used to, to tear people down. And so he challenged us to be encouragers this past week and to build other people up. And so if you missed that, definitely go on our website, check it out, bleep number one. Next week, You'll definitely want to be back for bleep number three. We're going to be talking about how God uses our words. He can use the tongue uh, to share with others about Jesus and to help other people uh, know more about Jesus. So you'll definitely want to be back for that, for bleep number three. Today, we're going to be looking at how the words that we say and the way that we talk can show or reveal uh, the condition of our heart. And then maybe if we don't like what we see, how we can experience change. So if you have a Bible, you can open up to James chapter 3. James chapter 3 is where we've been in this series, and we're going to continue there today. Uh, before we get there, my family grew up going to church. Like week in, week out, we went to church. I was a leader in my youth ministry, and so we were there almost every week. And for many of you, you know, like if you've got kids or if you grew up in a family with multiple, you know, brothers and sisters, you know how Sunday mornings can be. Like you're trying to get up, everybody's trying to get ready, you're trying to eat breakfast, you're trying to get in the car, you're trying to get out the door, you're trying to get to church, make it there on time, and it's kind of rush, 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 scram, scram. You know, so there's arguing, sometimes there's bickering, there's yelling back and forth, trying to get into the car, and then you get into church and then everything's perfect, right? You get there and you start singing, you hear a message, you know, you got to put on, you know, you put on the face to make, you know, it looks like everything's going okay in your family, you know, don't want anybody to know anything's wrong or anything's going on. And so you worship God, you have some sick fellowship, you know, and then you get back in the car and it's like in five seconds, it's right back to the same old thing, same lifestyle, you know, rush, 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 talking, you know, arguing. Um, and this is some of what my family went through growing up. I had three brothers and, you know, bless my mom's heart, you know, she uh, trying to get us up on Sundays and get us ready for church and uh, get us fed and out the door and all that kind of stuff. It was just, man, it was the biggest hassle. Well, this one Sunday we had been at church, you know, again, we're worshiping God, we're hearing from his word, we're spending some time in prayer, and we get out of church and we get to the car and my mom and I are arguing. Like, we are getting after it, getting into it. We're arguing back and forth all the way home. We had just been at church, and we're arguing, going back and forth. We get home, I get out of the car, and my mom is in my face. 
Like literally, I'm kind of backing up and I run into the car and I, I'm kind of, the car's behind me and I can't go anywhere and she's just in my face, you know, with her finger in my face, just giving it to me. And all I, you know, my only response in the moment is I, I put my hand on her chest, I push her and say, step back. And then I walked off. And, uh, you know, feeling pretty, pretty, pretty bad about myself, all right? So I walk off, I'm feeling pretty good, you know, feeling like a big man. And my dad, on the other side of our Suburban, comes running around the car, grabs me by my arm, drags me into the house, into his room, lays me over on his bed, takes his belt off, and spanks me. I was 17. I was a junior in high school, and my dad is spanking me like there is no tomorrow. I just disrespected his wife, but we were just at church. Like, we were just at church worshiping God, and then my mom and I are arguing, and I tell her to step back, and I pushed her. I mean, how does that happen? Like, how do you go from being at church and worshiping God and hearing from his word and praying, and then five seconds later with the same mouth saying something so disrespectful to my mom like I did? Like, that doesn't make sense, does it? And James, the brother of Jesus, he's going to kind of ask the same question here in James chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7. And if you don't have a Bible, if it's not in a translation you understand very well, you can pick one up at the back of all the worship centers at all of our campuses. They're free. It's on us. You can go and grab one. We're on page 291 if you're in one of our blue Bibles. But James chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Let's get going here. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who've been made in the image of God. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Here's what James is basically saying. Like, how can blessing and worship, praise for God, how can that come out, of this, come out of the same mouth as cursing or tearing somebody down or in my case being disrespectful to my mom? Like, how does that happen? Like, how can you have both coming out of the same mouth? Like, is that How's that, how's that possible? Like, how's it possible for a follower of Jesus to talk in a way that doesn't honor God? Like, how is that even possible? It's basically what he's saying. Like, how does it make sense for me to come to church and, and worship God, and then for me in, in middle school and high school, and then to cuss? Like, I was at, I'd be at church and I'd worship God. I was a leader in my youth ministry, but then I got around my friends at school or at work or wherever, and you know, I had a terrible mouth. And not just like the light cussing, you know, like the bad, like the bad cussing. I had a terrible mouth. But how does that make sense? Like, how does it make sense for me to worship God on Sundays, but then talk in a way that dishonors God all throughout the week? Like, that doesn't make sense. How does it make sense for me to come and, and, and to preach or, or, or to come to church and worship and then go home and talk to my wife in a harsh way? Like, that doesn't make sense, does it? That out of the same mouth, you, you, you come to church and worship God, and then with that same mouth, you'd be disrespectful or harsh towards your spouse and the way that you talk to him? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that my boys, Levi and Coben, I've got Levi, who's five and uh, about to turn six, Coben, who is three, and they can be playing together and just having a great time, and, and Coben will tell Levi, you know, Levi, I love you. And Levi's like, Coben, I, I love you so much. And, you know, Darby and I, my wife, will hear that, we'll overhear them playing together and say that to her. Like, oh, that is so sweet. You know, they're playing, they're getting along, they love each other. It's just, just it's so great, so perfect. And the very next moment, they get frustrated with each other, and one of them will tell the other one, you're not my brother anymore. <laughs> like, you loved each other in one second, and then the very next moment, you're disowning each other. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, how can that come out of the same mouth? 
See, what James is saying here is that it's not the fruit or the evidence of a believer, of a follower of Jesus, for blessing and cursing to come out of the same mouth. He says it just it doesn't make sense. It's not the fruit or the evidence of a believer. So here's kind of the main idea I want you to catch today. And if you have a bulletin, you can write this down on the back. But here's kind of the big theme for today. What we say and how we talk show whether or not we're really followers of Jesus. What we say and how we talk show whether or not we're really followers of Jesus. And so when you examine your life and the things that you talk about, the things that you say all, all, all throughout the week, when you examine that, like I don't know about you, but for me, it, if I talked in a way that wasn't honoring or glorifying to God like all throughout the week, I would want to know, well, how can I change the way that I talk? Or as James puts it here in chapter 3, how can I tame my tongue? How can I change the way that I'm talking? Well, James says here in chapter 3, nobody can. Like the tongue is so evil. It, it says in James 3, in full of this deadly poison, nobody can tame the tongue. And obviously James is, James is right. You can't. You can't tame your tongue, but somebody else can. Somebody else can. Check this out. This is Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Jesus says this. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. Now, some of your translations will say from storing up good things in your heart. So it says a good, per a good person can produce good things from the treasury of a good heart or from storing up good things in your heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And then check this out. What you say flows from what is in your heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So Jesus is saying, basically, and some of your translations, uh, other translations say this, out of the overflow of your heart, of what's in your heart, your mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of what's in your heart, your mouth speaks. Or in other words, you can look at it this way. I can look at the things that I say. I can examine the way that I talk, the words that come out of my mouth, and it can tell me what is in my heart. It can show me the condition of my heart, of whether it's in the right place or not, whether it's good or bad. I can identify by the way that I talk. That's what, that's what Jesus is saying. So here's some ways that you can know you need a heart change. Four things that you can tell and know that you need a heart change. Number one, you know you need a heart change if you tear other people down. You tear other people down. The Bible calls this gossip and slander. And so you know you need a heart change if you gossip about people, if you slander, tear other people down. Here's what the Bible says about slander and gossip. This is Romans 129. And these verses won't be on the screen, so you can... Write them down if you'd like to, but this is Romans 129. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. Like it says that equates gossip with wickedness, murder, deception. It's like in the same sentence there. This is Ephesians 4.31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Check this out. Jewish rabbis used to call the tongue or refer to the tongue as an arrow. The reason they would call it an arrow is because an arrow could wound or kill its victim from a far distance. See, it doesn't make sense that worship would come out of the same mouth as gossip and slander. It just doesn't make sense. Number two, you know you need a heart change if you complain all the time. If you complain all the time. Here's what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. See, it doesn't make sense for complaining and arguing to come out of the same mouth as worship. 
and praise for God. It just doesn't make sense. It's not the fruit of a follower of Jesus. Number three, you know you need a heart change if you cuss. If you cuss. Here's what the Bible says about cussing. Ephesians 4 verse 29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Colossians 3 verse 6, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. See, that, that used to be, supposed to be, used to be something that was a part of our life when we were still a part of this world, when we weren't followers of Jesus. So see, it doesn't make sense to worship God and then with the same mouth, the same tongue to, to cuss or to use foul language. And then fourth, you know you need a heart change. If you tell dirty jokes, laugh at dirty jokes, participating in dirty jokes, you know you need a heart change. Here's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 4. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. See, it doesn't make sense to worship God and that with the same mouth, the same tongue, that tell dirty jokes, participate dirty, laugh at dirty jokes, it just doesn't make sense. It's not the fruit or the evidence of a follower of Jesus. Now, my first job in ministry was as a youth pastor. I did that for about four years and just I had the time of my life. We, we loved it. And each year we would take our students, middle school and high school, to uh, youth camp. And this one year at youth camp in particular, our junior and senior guys were just, they were telling dirty jokes, they were making fun of each other, they were making fun of the, the younger kids and putting them down, and so I got them all together, all the junior and senior guys in this cabin, and, and um, I was reading Ephesians 5 to them, and Ephesians 5 talks about being imitators of God as dearly loved children, like that we should seek to be like Him, and then it talks about, you know, not, of course, joking and foolish talk and building each other up, not tearing people down, and so I was sharing all of this with them, and they were really uh, taking it in and, and taking it to heart. In fact, so much so that they came up with E5 based on Ephesians 5 in order to remember it. And so they were, take, they were putting E5 all over everything. They were writing it on their hands. They were writing it on their arms. You know, somewhere it was like a tattoo on their arms, E5. Um, a guy, some of them started writing it on some white undershirts, just big, real big E5 on the front of their shirt. One kid on his basketball shoes, I remember like with a Sharpie, wrote E5 on his basketball shoes. And then they came up with a gang sign to remember it, E5. And they would flash it to each other. You know, if things were getting out of hand, if, they, you know, if it was getting dirty or, the, you know, they were putting people down or whatever, you know, they'd flash E5 as a way to remember, you know, this message from Ephesians chapter 5. And so as a youth minister, I'm just, man, this is awesome. They're getting it. They're taking this in. They're wanting to remember it. They're applying it to their lives. It's just one of those, you know, special, cool things as a youth minister. You're investing in these guys and, you know, and they're, man, they're just, they're really taking it to heart and, and wanting to live this out. So it was, you know, I was feeling really good about myself. And then they, they kept reading in Ephesians chapter five, where it talks about husbands and wives and it says wives should submit to their husbands. And so then they started going around camp and telling all the girls to know their role and they would flash E5, <laughs> know your role, girl. You know, cutting in line, making them get up out of their chairs and doing all kinds of stuff. E5, know your role. I was like, oh my gosh. You know, this started out so good and it ended so badly. Uh, but here's the thing. When we, when we talk in a way that doesn't honor God, it, it says one of two things about us. Number one, you may be a follower of Jesus, but your heart is not in the right place. According to Jesus, it, it's not good. Like your heart's not good. It's not in a good place. Or number two, you're not a follower of Jesus. James says this in James chapter 1, verse 26. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. And your religion is worthless. Obviously, what we say, the words that we use, according to the Bible, are very 
important. So much so that it can show, it can reveal whether or not we're really followers of Jesus or whether or not we're fooling ourselves. Like deceiving ourselves, thinking that we're something that we're not. So you can claim to be something all day long. But according to James, just because you worship God on one hour a week, if out of the same mouth, the same tongue is used for cursing and all these things that we've been talking about, something's not right there. I mean, it's one of two things. Either if you're a follower of Jesus, your heart's not in the right place, or, or you're not a follower of Jesus. But if we're constantly building people up like we're encouragers and, and we, we're worshiping God and we're talking about Jesus and telling other people about Jesus and, and we talk to people in a, you know, in a respectful way, talking to our spouse in a loving, respectful way, it shows that our hearts are good. And according to Jesus, our, our heart would be good because we've been storing up or treasuring good things. So what are, what are these good things like that Jesus is talking about? Like, I don't know about you, I, I want to know, what are these good things that I can store up, that I can treasure, that's going to change my heart and then change the way that I talk? Well, first of all, if you're not a follower of Jesus, it all begins with having a relationship with Jesus. Like, if you've never committed your life to Christ before, it's not about going from here and then trying to better to talk better or to not cuss. That, that's, that's not what it's about. It starts with a relationship with Jesus because here's the thing. Only Jesus can change your heart and tame your tongue. He's the only one that can. You can't, but he can. And so the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. When you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us. And boast about it. I want you to catch that. I'm going to read it again. And hopefully I'm, I'm wanting this to sink in because this is probably the most important idea in all of the Bible. And I don't want you to miss this. We, in America today, we've gotten this so confused of what it means to be a Christian, a, a follower of Jesus. And, and many people, like it says in James 1, are deceiving themselves into thinking they're something that they're not because they've gotten this wrong. The Bible says salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Like it's not about trying harder to be a better person. Or it's, you're not saved when you've read your Bible enough times or when you've been to church enough times or, or because you were baptized as an infant or child or as an adult. You're not saved when, when, when you're baptized. You're not saved when your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. And, and maybe when you stand, maybe he'll let you into heaven because, you know, your good deeds outweigh your, your bad deeds. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, the Bible is very clear. And this may sound strange, but good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done. It said in verse 8 that we're saved by God's grace when you believe. Believe what? Well, several things. First of all, when you believe that you are not good enough to have a relationship with God or to go to heaven when you die. See, the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's standard to have a relationship with him and to go to heaven when we die. We've all sinned. I've sinned and fallen short of God's standard to have a relationship with him. I'm not good enough to have a relationship with God or to go to heaven when I die. I'm not good enough because of my sin. I've fallen short of God's standard. His standard is absolute perfection. And so every one of us, the Bible says, have fallen short of God's standard. That's why good people don't go to heaven because we're not good enough to have a relationship with God. Number two, you believe that there's a punishment for sin. Romans 6.23 says this, the wages of sin is death. That's eternity separated from God in hell. See, when you break man's law, you pay man's fine. And same thing is true with God. When you break God's law, you pay God's fine. There's a punishment for sin. There's a fine to be paid for our sin. So you believe that there's a punishment for sin. You believe that Jesus died for your sin, 
paying your fine. The Bible says this in Romans 5, 8, that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. Like through his death on the cross, he paid your fine. He took your punishment that you and I deserve. He took it upon himself and through his death on the cross, he paid your fine for sin. He took your punishment for sin and he paid it. It's paid in full. Jesus died on the cross for you and for me to take the punishment for our sin upon himself so that we wouldn't have to experience it. You believe that Jesus rose from the dead. See, the Bible teaches that not only did Jesus die on the cross for our sins and they put him in a tomb, but three days later he rose from the dead. You know, the Bible teaches that over a period of 40 days, Jesus made appearances to different people, that he ate with people and talked with people over a, a period of 40 days. He appeared to his disciples. He appeared to people that didn't believe that he was the son of God. He appeared to people like his brother James, who we've been reading, who did not believe that his brother was the son of God, appeared to James. James became a follower of Jesus. The Bible says that he appeared to more than 500 people at one time. And here's the crazy thing. All of these people died as martyrs saying they were eyewitnesses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Like not that someone else told them or it was passed down to them. They died saying they were eyewitnesses. In fact, the Bible records that they said, we, we, we saw him with our eyes. We touched him with our hands. He was risen from the dead and it absolutely changed their lives so much so that they were willing to die horrible, painful deaths as martyrs. Because they believed, they saw Jesus risen from the dead. And so Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Your sin will be forgiven past, present, and future. You'll be right with God and you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. When you confess that Jesus is Lord, we call that committing your life to Christ. Turning from your life in the direction you're going committing your life to him. Jesus is now Lord. I'm following him and believing that he died for you and he rose again. And the Bible says when, when you do that, when you commit your life to Christ, when you believe, not when you've been good enough, not when you go to church, not when you've been baptized, but when you believe and commit your life to Christ, you will be saved. Your sin will be forgiven and you'll be right with God. And for many of you today, that's the decision that you need to make. That's where it all begins, is beginning that relationship with Jesus by committing your life to him and believing that he died for you. And if that's you, today's your day, now's your time. I, I, I want to challenge you to take out that bulletin that you received when you came in at all of our campuses. At the bottom, there's a card called the connection card. And on the back, there's a box that says, I'm committing my life to Christ. Fill out that card, check that box. Take it back to the Next Step Center at all of our campuses. We've got a free gift for you just to help you in your new relationship with Jesus. And so if that's you, you've never made that decision before. Man, today, today is your day. Now is your time to commit your life to Christ and to believe that he died for you and paid your, paid your fine for sin so that you won't have to. That's the best news ever. And so I want to challenge you to make that decision today if you never have. If you are a follower of Jesus, your heart is continually changed as you grow in your relationship with him. As Jesus puts it, as you store up those good things. And so I don't know about you, but I'm, I kind of think, well, what are these good things that I can store up that help me to grow spiritually and, and grow in my relationship with Jesus and the as I do so, he'll, he'll change my heart and change the way that I talk. Well, I think some of those things are things like reading your Bible. And as you hear from God in his word and you begin to live it out and apply it to your life, your heart begins to be stored, you begin to store up these good things that change your heart, change the way that you talk. As you spend time in prayer, and you speak with God and God speaks to you, you're storing up good things that are changing your heart, changing your life. It, as you go to church and you worship with other believers and you hear from God's word and you spend time in prayer, you're storing up good things. It's changing your heart, changing the way that you talk. As you 
get into a small group and you're held accountable for your relationship with Jesus throughout the week and reading your Bible and praying and hearing from God, developing that relationship with him throughout the week, not, not just going to church one hour a week, but developing that relationship with him throughout the week. And that's what we do in our small groups, in our life transformation groups. You're, you're held accountable for that. So you can continue to grow in your relationship with Jesus throughout the week. You're storing up good things. You're storing up good things as you serve. Invest in others. Help other people know more about Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus came to serve and not to be served. And so as we serve, we're storing up good things. As we give, we're storing up good things. As we talk about Jesus and share Jesus with others, we're storing up good things. And as you can see, as we continue to do these things, our hearts begin to overflow with good things. It changes our lives. It changes the way that we talk because Jesus is overflowing out of our hearts. See, I think part of the problem is, especially in America today, the Christian life has been relegated to one hour a week where we come and sit in rows, sit in chairs, and we watch. I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind for us as followers of Jesus, just to sit in a row one hour a week. That's not a relationship. That's attending a gathering. I think Jesus wanted for us to have a relationship with him that's daily, that goes throughout the week where we're storing up these good things that result in the overflow of your heart, changing the way that we talk. I, I think that Jesus intended for us to have that daily relationship with him. I told you as I was growing up, I, I went to church almost every week. But I had a real problem with cussing and telling dirty jokes and laughing at dirty jokes and just, man, the way that I talked was not honoring or glorifying to God in the least. I was somebody totally different at school and at work. And you could tell by the way that I talked that I was very different. And with the same mouth, I would worship God and then I, I would cuss or talk in a way that wouldn't honor God. And I did that most of junior high in high school until about the second semester of my junior year in high school. I was involved in a small group with some guys and, and we were reading the Bible together and praying together and we were holding each other accountable for that daily relationship with God. And so we would come and, and you'd have to share, you know, what you read that week and how God had spoken to you and, and how you were trying to live that out. And we would all share about that and pray for each other to grow in our relationships with Jesus all throughout the week, which is what we do in our small groups as well. And I'm going to tell you, over time, that began to change me. It began to change me in a way that just attending church on the weekend and just, again, sitting in a chair and watching, just it hadn't done that for me yet because I didn't have a daily growing relationship with Jesus. I wasn't storing up those good things that we were talking about. But as I began to do that, my, the second semester of my, my junior year in high school, my life began to change. I mean, it began to change the things that I thought about, the things that I wanted even in this life. It, it changed the way that I talked. It, it changed uh, my, my vision, my direction, my passion. It changed everything. It changed what I listened to. So much so that a friend of mine got in a car, my car after school one day. I was taking him home and I turned my truck on and instead of the normal music that came blasting over my speakers that I had always listened to, Jesus had been changing my life because I'd been storing up these good things. And when I started my car, worship music came over the speakers of my car. And my friend getting in the car literally said, what the bleep is that? And so I began to tell him about what was happening in my life and what Jesus was doing in my life and how this change was coming about. But you see, my, my life began to change as I was storing up those good things and the overflow was a changed life. The overflow changed the way that I talked. Our bands are gonna come and lead us at all of our campuses. We're gonna sing some songs together. But 
But as we do, I, I, I want to challenge you to examine your life in light of the way that you talk. Examine your heart in light of the way that you talk. Are you tearing people down, gossiping and slandering? Complaining, arguing, cussing, telling dirty jokes? Is that the way that you talk when, when you leave here and kind of throughout the week? Or are you honoring God with the words that you're using? What about you guys that are married at all of our campuses? Are, are you talking to your spouse in a way that's glorifying or honoring to God in a loving and respectful way? Or do you speak to each other in a very harsh tone, disrespectful, hateful, and always arguing? Man, I want you to examine your heart in light of the things that you say, in light of the way that you talk to other people. And allow God to work in your heart. And so as we sing, I, I, I want to ask you that just, man, ask and pray and ask God to change your heart. And to give you the passion and desire to store up these good things. Maybe, maybe your relationship with God needs to go beyond one hour a week on Sunday. Maybe you need to begin to develop and store up these good things throughout the week and really have a daily relationship with Jesus. We're going to have prayer teams on either side of the stage at all of our campuses. And if God's speaking to you today or if there's something you'd like prayer for or someone to pray over you about, I just want to challenge you to make your way out of your row. Allow one of our prayer team members to pray for you. But we're going to pray and then we're going to sing together. I just want to ask you would join me in just asking God to reveal to you the condition of your heart based on the way that you talk. God, I thank you for Jesus. God, because it's Jesus who can change our hearts right now. It's Jesus that can tame our tongues. And so God, I pray right now for every one of us just to have a powerful encounter with Jesus. God, I pray for those that don't know you, that, that they would have a, an encounter with Jesus right now, that they would commit their lives to Jesus and realize that good people don't go to heaven, forgiven people do, and that they would commit their life to Christ, believing that he died for them. But God, I pray right now as we sing, as we worship together at all of our campuses, God, that you would move in our hearts. Give us a passion and desire to grow in our relationship with you every day this week. And God, I pray that it would be true of us that blessing and cursing are not coming out of the same mouth. But that God, the way that we talk would show that we are followers of Jesus. I ask that in your name. Amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow. Com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.